Hey there YouTube! Welcome back to Artichoke Dip. My name is Rob, Solo Tabletop Gamer. I got a very special video lined up for you this time. Oh yeah, that smells over the top. Before we get into it, precautions have been taken. Such as, for example, this dice proof cup. Won't let what happened in the last video. Let's see how it works. 20 cider. It just does not penetrate. Does not get through. Bounces on the table and gives me a 13. So, what if you had the chance to meet one of your favorite authors? The opportunity to sit down and talk to them, ask them questions, get to know them a little bit better. Would you take that opportunity? Not many people actually get an opportunity in their lifetime to be able to actually do this reach out and talk to an author but what if theoretically speaking that author is an author of role-playing games particularly a game system you're very fond of and we're gonna get into that in this video but but before we do gotta get something out of the way here a little disclaimer if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you have not subscribed, please click that subscribe button. Hit that bell icon every time I upload a brand new video. You will hear about it. Oh yeah, you will. So let's get into the video and see what it has to offer us. Well, I drink my coffee here with my dice proof cup. All right, folks, let's jump right on over into this, shall we? Hey there YouTube, this is Artichoke Dip, and welcome to a special episode. I'm here with Kevin from Palladium Books. So Kevin, for those people out there that have been living under a rock, can you tell us what Palladium's Books is, and what do you guys do? We do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, Palladium Books is a role-playing game company. We've been uh, making role-playing games for 38 years. Started back in the 80s. We did uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Robotech, uh, and then uh, our big game, most, our most famous game is Rifts. But we also did Palladium Fantasy, Heroes Unlimited, uh, Ninjas and Super Spies, Beyond the Supernatural, The Mechanoid Invasion. Uh, you name it, we do it. We have uh, a couple of horror games, uh, Night Spawn, or excuse me, Night Bane. We had to change the name from Night Spawn to Night Bane because uh, of the Spawn comic book franchise. Ah, uh, okay, okay. And uh, Beyond the Supernatural, uh, yep, yep. Chaos Earth, Splicers. So we do everything. I mean, I love role playing games, I love all kinds of genres. So science fiction, fantasy, horror, post apocalyptic, you name it, we've done it. Which uh, is. Or are doing it. Just awesome about riffs because any and everything you can possibly want to play imagine setting you can do well riffs combines them all riffs is really a truly a multi-genre setting in a distant future in this post-apocalyptic world where it's called riffs because these terrors in space and time occur where lines of magic energy cross it creates this like energy matrix and it opens up and uh, from the ley lines that right cross right and uh, these ley lines of magic energy where they cross terrors in space and time rifts open up and uh, they lead to all kinds of alien worlds and things you can go through it and visit other worlds or creatures and monsters and alien invaders come through the rifts into our earth and it's uh, it's pretty awesome. It's very awesome. <laughs> Technically, the cyber I love the Cyber Knight character. That is really really sparked my imagination, and I love that when I can sit down and I can read a book, and before I even play a game, when I get done reading the description, I feel as if I've already played a role playing game in my head. And That's for the, awesome. For the solo enthusiast, that is awesome. Well, we try to put a lot of color, a lot of a lot of 
world, world world building, character development, story. That's sort of my specialty. So, yeah, we try to put a lot into our our game settings. That is, well, you have done a great job. Thank you. I talk about it a lot. So, what was your first role playing game, and that you have ever played? What did, if you had to narrow that down? Well, that, that's easy. Um, you know, like most people, I started playing D and G, D and D. Okay. Um, so Dungeons and Dragons was my first experience, and uh, it's funny because when I first started to play, um, it sounded like a cool idea, role playing games. Uh, my my buddy Julius Rosenstein. He and I were working in an art supply shop uh, a million years ago, and uh, he had discovered role playing, and he was ranting and raving about it. And I thought this is pretty cool, and he's like, "Oh yeah, you got to try it." So I, I met some of his friends, and we played a game. And to be honest, the very first game that I played, I think I was more distracted by a pretty girl <laughs> in the room, and uh, there were all these rules that I didn't get, and I could never remember which dice to roll, and. I could never get armor class in D&D because you had to check this chart and the lower your armor class the better it was and anyway the first game was just sort of chaos for me and then uh, I played with another game master twice and I didn't like his style of gaming and I thought you know what role playing sucks and I was pretty much done with it and Julius was like no no Kev you can't <laughs> it's, it's really great how about this let me take the four new players you and the other four players, and uh, I'll run something for you. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I think I'm done. And and he was so into it. And Julius is just a sweet guy. So I didn't want to hurt his feelings. And the other players were like, well, if you don't play, we're not going to play. And I'm like, what, what is this, grade school? I don't want to play. And they're like, no, we're not going to play. And I'm like, we hurt Julius's feelings. Oh, well. So I'm like, fine, I'll play. So we go and we play. It was cosmic. It was great. My character dies at the end of the game being stupid. It was still awesome. I was hooked. That was it. And you can thank Julius Rosenstein because otherwise I would have gone on to do comic books or other stuff. And Palladium would have never, never have happened. Man. So what was your source of inspiration to create your first RBG, the Mechanoid Invasion? Well, it so... If you look at the release of our products chronologically, that's the first game that got released. And it's actually a really good question. The first game that I actually developed was the Palladium Fantasy RPG. I wanted to release it as a big, juicy, 300-some page book, and I wanted to do it as a perfect bound um, soft cover. 8.5 by 11 soft cover edition, which at the time was a, like a new technology. Uh, everything was either hardcover or pamphlets in a box yep. when it came to gaming. And I had discovered, uh, I was always in the <coughs> books and art books, and I had discovered perfect bound books, and I'm like, what is this? And they were infinitely cheaper than doing a hardcover book, and I'm like, this is what we're going to do. And I didn't have a lot of money. Um, I grew up very poor in, in Detroit and uh, didn't have the resources to produce that big juicy book. So what I decided to do was to come out with a, some smaller games and source books and then just funnel all the money back into the company until I could afford to do the game I really wanted to do, which was Palladium Fantasy. And Mechanoids kind of grew out of that. I wanted to do something that was cool and different. and. Um, I, I, I'm a big comic book guy, science fiction guy, fantasy guy, and so I had just done a fantasy game, not that it was published, but um, I thought it'd be fun to do sort of a dying earth kind of science fiction game, which is what the Mechanoids is. And um, there's pretty cool concepts, and I did 90% of the artwork, and um, that was a lot of fun. I was really into... Uh, different uh, artists like uh, Sid Mead, and who, the guy who did uh, designs for 2010, a space, uh, the sequel to 2001 a Space Odyssey, and the guy who did uh, all the designs for Blade Runner, um, who was a local Detroit guy, by the way, Sid Mead. Wow. Yeah, yeah, he grew up in the auto industry and went on to become what he calls a futurist. And... Uh, so I just had fun with it, and I got some input from my, my new friend at the time, Eric Wojcik. 
and uh, Bill Lopes and Mechanoids came out. I did it as a series of small books. The reason it came out is like a small, um, actually I could have vis visual references. Okay. Um, I have some of this stuff right behind me. Sorry. See this? It's getting terrible terrible pride video. of life right here. <laughs> <laughs> so the first book, this is the very first book that we released as a game. And uh, the reason it's comic book size and even printed on newsprint um, is that my background is comic books. So I knew how to do comic books. I knew how to, I knew a couple comic book printers. So we did The Mechanoid Invasion as our first book. And then the second book in the series was The Journey. And then the third book in the ser Mechanoid series was Homeworld. And you have released a trilogy book where you've taken all of yeah, those combined we, we them into one. Yeah, we them all up. And, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, it was all experimental, and uh, we were new to, to all of this stuff. So, uh, and I'm, I'm like the world's worst speller. Uh, I can write up a storm and come up with great ideas, but I spell like crap and still do. Thank God for computer spell checkers and editors. Yes. But, uh, so... This first book should be a collector item for no other reason that there are 20 typos a page. <laughs> I am not kidding. <laughs> so the interesting thing is going to be, and I'm going to pick this book up because you've combined all of them into one. Yep. And uh, I cannot wait to get my hands on that and go through it and talk to my audience and explain oh, nice. to them and get that out there, especially a lot of uh, my viewers that love solo RPG. Some of them are fantasy buffs like us and they right. like the sci-fi uh, type of gaming and I think this they would absolutely love that so that is awesome I'm looking forward to that. Oh cool well, well the kind of fun thing about this with the Mechanoid Invasion and it does have a really strong cult following is that it's almost like three generations of the story um, so it starts off very kind of end of the world, because uh, basically the mechanoids, they hate humanity for reasons I won't ruin for you. And uh, they find this, this, this colony planet uh, um, that's being terraformed by, you know, Earth colonists. And uh, they literally are coming to tear apart the planet. They, they basically can take the whole planet apart and utilize the energy and the minerals and all that stuff. They're, they're planet killers. And they're here to dice up the planet. And, and the reason the second book is called The Journey is because the, the only way to survive the original Mechanoid Invasion book is to make your way onto the alien spaceships. And these guys are they're these gigantic machines. I mean, there's some smaller Earth size, or Earth size, human size um, mechanoids to, to battle, but um, most of the mechanoids are, are humongous because they're to take apart planets. So basically, in the journey, you are living like mice between the walls of the spaceship. And then Homeworld is a bunch of different alien races and humanity getting together to oppose the mechanoids, and uh, it's, it's fun stuff. It sounds fun. It sounds absolutely fun. So what advice would you give to people looking to work in the tabletop gaming industry? If somebody, some people I notice out there on my channel, they're saying, hey, I'm going to write a book for this. I'm going to get into that. I'm going to try to get this self-published. Well, I think the main thing is to be true to yourself. Um, you know, trust your gut. Have fun with it. Uh, I think one reason we've been so successful is that everyone here truly loves what we do. And because we love what we do, we put our heart and souls into it. And I think it really comes across in the book. Um, and having said, you know, be true to yourself and, and, and trust your gut, you do also need to think about your audience. Sure. Um, you know, every book I've ever written, I've written with my audience in mind. So there are some things sometimes that I come up with and I'm thinking, well, you know, it's so niche, I, you know, and I throw it out. And, and that's the hardest part, by the way, is killing your babies, deciding what stuff in your book needs to get axed in, in what stays. Um, I always said the hardest part 
of, of writing any book is deciding, you know, what goes in it. Because um, you want it to have a good flow, you want it to have wow factor, um, you want it to, um, you know, give your audience ideas, not just for the adventures you might lay out in the book, but for future adventures, things that they can do, um, how they can build a campaign and just take your stuff as a foundation and run with it. Um, so there's actually a lot, lot to it. But you know, if you love it and that's what you want to do, you know, you should do it. You know, give it a try. And that's excellent advice. It's real excellent advice, sir. You and know, in these days, it looks it, like it, it's worked out well for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we've been at it 38 years. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's worked out okay. Yeah, I would have to say so. And you know, we're talking about the gaming industry, and we've gotten into which is now the MMORPG, or the mass media online right. role-playing games. And within, I'm going to say the last, gosh, five years now, there's been this large reemergence back into what they call the OSR, old school role-playing, just tabletop right. role-playing. Right. All these people Thank goodness. have gotten burned out on, you know, having a limited selection of characters that they can only... At that point, how can I put personalize the way that they want it? And they're constantly playing a developed level over and over again without any changes. So, with that, where do you see the tabletop gaming industry going in the future? Um, it's hard to say. I, I think it's certainly you're right. We're certainly seeing a resurgence in role playing, especially in the last three years. Uh, which is nice, and you know, having been in the industry so long, it's it's interesting for me because I have almost 40 years of perspective, uh, actually longer than 40 years because I, I was a gamer before I started my own company. And so when role playing came in, it was it, what I find interesting is that miniature games, which were more historical miniature games at the time, um, they were fading out, and role playing was a new fad. Mm -hmm. Role playing was a new big thing. Fast forward 30, 35 years, and miniature games, board games are the new thing, and role playing games are kind of fading. But there's always these ebbs and flows. I've seen it in comic books too. Uh, one of my, my favorite, favorite, favorite lines from a famous comic book guy, uh, Will Eisner, said that if he had $10 every time he heard how the comic book industry was on the skids and going out of business, he'd be a millionaire because, and, and it, they're just natural ebbs and flows. Oh, sure. So I think, you know, when new technology, new ideas come out, like video games and card games and various other things, and in recent years, all the new technologies that made miniatures and miniature games much more affordable. Um, so there's a gazillion of them out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, all those create different ebbs and flows in, in the marketplace and role-playing game is is having a resurgence because I think a lot of people and all these games have their fun factor and have their value um, but I think for some people um, they're kind of tired of a particular kind of game whether it's a board game or a miniature game or a video game and now they're kind of looking for other things that might stimulate them and role-playing is just in a lot of ways it's the ultimate storytelling medium. Absolutely. Um, so I think people are kind of re rediscovering that and going, wow, these games are awesome, which they are. To me, there's just nothing nothing, nothing more fun and challenging than a role-playing game. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. If I had a choice between playing the latest video game out on the market or playing Palladium Fantasy, I'm going to go to Palladium Fantasy. I love that because I'm only limited to my imagination. Well, that's that's the amazing thing, and that's that's one of our taglines in, in, in our, our books is that you're only limited by your imagination, and explore the megaverse because that's the awesome thing with role playing, is whatever you can imagine, whether it's in a book or in your head, you can bring to life. Absolutely. And the beauty of role playing, which all role players out there who are watching this already know when you get done role-playing you remember it like you just saw this fantastic movie or television series it's like an epic episode of game of thrones 
Except yes. your characters are part of the story. Your characters helped figure out something or destroyed the, the villains or the monsters you saved the day. And so your Conan or your whoever, it's just, it's epic. It is. It absolutely is. And that's what I'm always stressing in my videos. You are limited only to your imagination. And it's absolutely, yeah, absolutely correct. Well, and the thing is, what I guess I, and again, I'm not sure exactly who all your audience is, but so they may already know all this. But the beauty of role playing too is really only the game master needs to know, understand the rules inside and out. The players only need to know enough to play their character and use their magic or their super ability or their technological gear. And they can really focus on the story elements. So it's really nice in that you only need to know enough and then the rest of it is all about the characters and the stories and their interactions. And, and that's the beauty of what role playing is. So Palladium has a huge catalog of books. You guys have a lot of game systems out that you put out over the years. Of all the game systems that you put out and you have created, which one's your favorite and what makes it the favorite one you've ever, when I say favorite, did you, uh, how do I put this, you enjoyed the most creating? Um, well, that that's actually a, kind of a tough question. Um, and I get it all the time. My, my pet answer is, well, gosh, it's like asking which of your ten kids are your favorite. You know, <laughs> it's... They're all your favorite. You know, there's something about all of them that, that you love and makes them special. Sure. Um, my favorite game to write, I think, is Riffs because it is just totally gonzo, over the top, open. You can write anything. The amazing thing with Riffs is if you want to have a story arc that's, you know, basically detective noir, you can. You want sort of old west action with cyborgs and aliens. You can. You want to have something that's heavily mystical based, full of dragons and mystical creatures and cyber knights. You can. Whatever you want in Rifts. And you can go, it's set up too, where you can like e seamlessly flow from like one genre into the other or mix them. And it's just so endlessly open. Um, I just love, I love writing for Rifts. That's why there's like 90 books. I know, I've been, I've been looking at them and uh, ordering some online to get them heading to my place. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot more coming, I'm afraid. But the game I love to play, and again, I love playing a lot of the stuff, and I go through phases. There was a phase where I played Robotech like crazy, and Heroes Unlimited, I'm a comic book guy, so Heroes Unlimited, um, I love Beyond the Supernatural uh, as well. Um, Dead Rain, our zombie game is more than just your typical zombie game and that's that's a lot of fun. It's also a great introductory game. But my favorite game of all time, and I don't know if it's because it was the game that started everything, but it's Palladium Fantasy. I I, I love Palladium Fantasy. I, that's my go to game. I love about your system and when I talked to you on the phone I talked about this a lot was the fact that a lot of other RPG systems out there and I'm, I'm going to talk about the D20 perspective here, to where you just roll a 20 side here and you try to hit this number for your armor class. But over time, your character gets close to death, and they come back, and it gets close to death, and they come back. But that armor is always there. And in your system, you really got to pay attention to that. You have this thing called structural damage capacity, yeah. which means you really got to pay very close attention to how much damage that armor is going to take, because after that, well, yeah, yeah, you're taking you're, it. <laughs> right. Well, to me, when I was when I approached the game design, I wanted to simulate a certain amount of. I hate using the term realism because there's really nothing real about fantasy or science fiction games, um, but I wanted the illusion of realism and plausibility. Uh, and I wanted things to make sense. Things had to feel plausible and logical to me in a game for it to really work. That's why I, I didn't like traditional dungeon crawls because, you know, you kick in door number one, you kill everything in there, you loot the place, you go right next door, door number two. They didn't hear people screaming, they didn't hear the fighting, they didn't hear you <laughs> smashing open doors. 
you kick in that door, repeat. And it's like, it makes no sense. If, if right now we heard a commotion in the next room, we'd be getting up and going to see what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and if you see there's maniacs looting the place and killing people, you're running for your life or you're calling to authorities. And, and to me, that's storytelling. That makes sense. So for me, if you're wearing armor, and in the case of fantasy, we're talking medieval type armor, it should offer a certain amount of protection but if you're getting clobbered with swords and axes and maces and whatever, claws, your armor is taking damage. And that's where SDC comes in. It's sort of like hit points for armor. So as you, your armor is taking damage, it's being whittled down. Um, and so, yeah, when your armor goes down to zero SDC, you're basically wearing shreds. And now that damage is coming off of you. And I think it also creates a certain amount of drama. Because Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, now you're vulnerable. And it's like, oh shit, man, when that creature claws me or bites me, it's not going on my armor. This is coming off me. I'm going to be bleeding. Now, as a solo player, and I can say, speak for a lot of my viewers out there, when you play RPG solo, and when you find a combat system as unique as yours, it really brings a lot into the game system. It oh, really good. adds a very, very unique, tasteful twist to the combat rather than just rolling a 20-sider, mm. rolling a 20-sider, rolling a 20-sider. And the other unique thing I found about your game system that I love is how you run a D20 with the percentile system for your skills side mm. by side, and they flow seamlessly across Thank the you. game system. And it... it I love that. I absolutely love that. Where some other game systems out there, they don't, they don't have that. They don't utilize that. And as for a solo perspective, that really does add a lot into the game, add more depth into the game. Oh, cool. Particularly for Good. the story side, the story aspect for it. Well, that's the thing. Actually, some people don't like that aspect, and I think, I think a lot of people look at games too rigidly. I, I guess I'm just a really flexible guy. I like possibilities and options, and I see no problem with combining elements of different game mechanics. So I don't see why everything has to be just, say, D20 um, or D6 or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, it just made sense to me that skills had a percentage where combat is you know, the roll of a die. Sure, which makes everything very streamlined and a very quick moving system with a lot of drama. Well, when I started the game, when I so my game grew out of the fact that I was running 26 guys every Saturday night. At, oh, wow. At, yeah. Um, that was my three and a half year Defiler campaign in downtown Detroit uh, off the Wayne State campus, uh, the, the Detroit Gaming Center that me and Eric Woodjick and Matt Ballant and several other people founded. And uh, it was awesome. For me, I always call it like a hot house of gaming experience because you had all these people coming all the time. If a new game came out, someone was walking through the door with it. You got to see everything that came out. You got to see tons of different styles of, of gaming. Um, and uh, so I'm running 26 guys because I, I, I hated saying no to people, right? So I needed something that was really fast. And we started out playing D&D, &D and it wasn't bad, but I needed other stuff. Plus, I, again, I want that realism. So I came up with my combat system, and it had to be quick and intuitive and make sense. Because otherwise, you know, 20 people were bored out of their minds. Wow, that must have been quite the list to keep track of all the initiatives. Um, <laughs> well, well, the cool thing is, <laughs> Like a lot of people say, how can you run 26 guys? And I guess it is kind of tricky, um, but a lot of it is like if you go to a party mm -hmm. and there's 26 people at a party, it's not all 26 people all talking at each other at once. Sure. You, know, you and me and five other guys go over here and we're talking about you know comic books or movies or whatever. And those people over there are talking about something else. And, and the same thing when you're running a big group like that. So you kind of are running like basically four or five groups 
in, in, in one big scenario. So what you do is, in your group, I'll be like, okay, Rob, what's your character doing? You know, it, oh, your your Cyber Knight's doing X, Y, and Z. Okay, great. Uh, what about you, Alex? And what about you, Tom? And then, uh, okay, and we play through some of the stuff you're going through, and it's probably interesting, so the rest of the guys are, are watching and listening. And then at some good, either dramatic point or just a good point to pause, it's like, okay, think about it. Like, especially if it's like, oh, well, we got to, you know, maybe pick the lock to this door, or we're listening to hear there's something inside. You know, what do we think it is? I'm like, I don't know, you hear this, this, and this. Like, oh, it could be that, could be this. I'm like, good, hold that thought. This group, what are you guys doing down the hall? And they tell me what they do, and then we go through that for a while. And, and, and if combat erupts, and of course, the problem is, you know, the group way over here is like, oh, do we know what's going on? Can we rush over and join the combat? <laughs> And, you know, maybe they can and maybe they can't. Um, but it works out really great, especially in combat. Because, again, you will pause it at some point, And it gives the guys who are locked in combat a chance to kind of catch their breath and think about, what are we going to do next? Oh, I was going to charge. But, you know what, maybe your character should, you know, prepare some magic and uh, throw up this or do that. Likewise, with other groups, they have time to kind of figure out what they're going to do. So by the time I get to them, they're all geared up and ready to go. And it's it's really just like I said, running a bunch of little groups. Uh, and then so obviously with the big battles, everyone kind of and yeah, those get a little crazy. I could but, see that. Uh, I could see that. <laughs> wow, wow. But it works really. Well. It works better than it may sound. I, I've actually there's been a couple of times at our first Palladium open house in 2006. Uh, I like demoed with like 30 people. Um, we just kind of spontaneously did a little gaming kind of thing and it worked really well. And then uh, back in like 2001 I was at uh, a university in New York and uh, we had this great st stadium seating and everything and I had like I think it was 21 or 23 people and we ran a complete game and it just really smooth and it's just a matter of kind of you know trying to remember where everything is and you know sure. I take notes <laughs> and it but it, it works really it works really smooth so when you ran large groups uh, a lot of people come in now when new people come in and they want to learn role-playing games and I I get asked this question a lot and I would interested on your perspective of this. so you get somebody brand new to, to role-playing games they want to get into it. And if you go on, we'll say Amazon, and you click role-playing games or anywhere else, I mean, you are inundated. There is so much out there. Yeah. What would you suggest for somebody just starting? Where should they start out? That, that's, a, that's a good question, too. Um, I think you should probably start wherever you feel comfortable and, and what interests you most. So if you're into fantasy, you know, look at several different fantasy games. Of course, I would suggest play Play fantasy. fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, pick one and kind of roll with it and, and realize, you know, part of, it's like anything though, it's like going to a movie, you know, you might like this movie and I may not. You know, not all role-playing games and all role-playing systems are, are the same or even similar. Not everything is your cup of tea, so don't necessarily be dissuaded by something if it doesn't really float your boat initially. You know, give it a try, think about it. I'll tell you the best way, and of course this isn't always possible for a lot of people, the best way is if you know someone who's running a game, is try to get into the game and that way you can see what's going on. Absolutely, learn the rules, um, see how everything runs. You know, like, like when I run new people, which happens all the time, especially at conventions. Uh, people have never played my game. Um, you know, it, it's, it, the rules are so really basic and simple. The, the, the core rules, understanding combat and hit points and that kind of thing, it's all pretty simple and intuitive. Once they get a basic understanding of that, the way I run, it's all about story. So, like even when I play with little kids, I was telling you on the phone how I, I, I for a while I was running uh, every like third or fourth Saturday at the uh, Westland Library. We were running games for, for kids, mostly teenagers, 
12 to 18 and uh, kids pick it up like that because you know this is the dice to roll here's your sword this is what it does here's the basics behind your character and again it's about for me it's about the character and the interaction and as the game master I'll be the guy who says okay Timmy now you you know you said you want to use your sword that's these three dice or these two dice and first you got to roll 20 sided you know and, and it's it's so easy to know because you know high rolls win defenders win tie absolutely that's the basics you're ready to rock and roll now you just need to know which dice to roll and as the game master I'm the guy who's gonna say okay that no nope, not not that die this die and uh, you know you roll it and you go on and now there is something very cool that I like about Palladium in your catalog the products you have and that is one thing I'll get comments on is you know people will say it's so hard to learn a new RPG because you got to read all the rules and you got to learn this so particularly for solo players a lot of my subscribers out there some of them are struggling with PTSD other people are just you know life happens as we get older and we get a family and we got children and we got all these responsibilities now and we really don't have time so a lot of guys will set aside a couple hours a week to be able to play solo so sure. keep going which is but, a great idea by the way I love the idea of solo well, games thank you yeah the cool thing I like about Palladium is just like you said you learn your rule sets and you can go from Palladium Fantasy to Rips from oh, Rips yeah, yeah. to Beyond the Supernatural and you already have that structured framework that knowledge of it that is so cool oh yeah that well, makes well you mentioned we had a lot of different genres yes uh, a lot of different world settings and and because I find everything fascinating and, and that was the onset of my game system I wanted you to be able once you learn the basic core rules those apply to everything we we produce so if you get tired of playing fantasy you want to play superheroes we've got a game for you you feel like playing horror you can play beyond the supernatural nightbane or or uh, dead rain um, you know you want uh, science fiction you can find some more old Robotech games or you can play Rifts uh, or Chaos Earth or Mechanoids uh, or Splicers so yeah it's and that's the thing too is don't overthink it I think that's part of the problem too is you know if you're just discovering a role-playing game no one expects you to be the master of it even if you're the like, so-called game master whether it's a solo game where you're playing yourself with yourself or that didn't sound right <laughs> <clears throat> whether you're playing solo um, or uh, you know whether you're the game master for the first time trying to run your three or four buddies you know just have fun with it it's all about this the story and interaction and the development of, of the plots and and where the characters go and how they grow and all that kind of stuff don't get bogged down with the rules. You'll figure it out, and at some point you might look and go, oh my gosh, I've been playing this rule wrong for the last six months. Hey, as long as everyone's been having fun. That's, you know, and that's what it's all about. It's about having fun yeah. at the end of the day. It's a game. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I stress that a lot. And, and you're right. When people are new to this and they get into it, they're afraid they're doing something wrong. And as long as you're using your imagination, you're having fun with it, you're creating this vivid world that's taking place inside of your head and like you said when you're done you sit back and it's like man that was an epic epic adventure this was cool because of this 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 and this you have done it right absolutely uh, when I started role-playing I didn't know Jack about it it was totally new I thought everyone in fact it was funny like decades later I find out that Eric Wojcik and Julius and all these other people had only been playing the game for like four to six months before me but somehow I thought they had been playing this for years and I was an idiot and so I know how people feel because I felt very uncomfortable and I felt very awkward as a game master and it's, it, it is to some degree a matter of trial and error but so is everything in life it's just it's about figuring it out and finding your pace and finding your comfort zone and then once you feel more at ease with it you just take off and have a blast with it. Absolutely. And I, you know, the one thing I have to give you kudos for that I just love. So, 
when I started out role playing and the red box D and D came yep. out, you know, my parents always loved to live out in the sticks. We never had really had neighbors. So growing up as a kid, it was always like, hey, you want to play this? You know, no, hey, no. So they had this little tutorial, a little solo tutorial that you <laughs> played through. And I must have played through that a hundred times since mm. I was, you mm -hmm. know. So then it dawned on me, even as a kid, I said, well, wait a minute, why can't I make this myself? Mm. And that's what I started doing. But I noticed there was the one thing that I really enjoyed, and maybe it could have been because it's been inspired by J.R. Tolkien's writing of Legolas. I always love the thought of that elf with the long bow, mm. the keen senses, the whole nine yards, but D&D &D doesn't really, they hint towards that, but they don't really give you a lot more yeah. beyond that. And then I got Palladium Fantasy, and I ran across the long, long bowman, and that was the very first character I created. I still have that character. Cool. I love that character. I love the oh, fact nice. that you that you seen, hey, there needs to be some emphasis on archery, a long bowman. Uh, and I have to give you kudos for that because not many other RPG systems out there actually do that. And that that makes Palladium Fantasy awesome. Oh, Very cool. awesome. Well, see, for me, part of it was just, you know, I'm sort of a history buff. And, you know, the longbow just changed warfare. Absolutely. Um, so, it historically, bow weapons played a tremendous role in combat and war. Um, so, for me, it was just, you know, a natural thing to include. Plus, you're right. I mean, it was in Lord of the Rings and... Absolutely, things. and that's oh man. And if you guys got to check it out, if you haven't picked it up, you need to pick up a copy. And man, all right, I got so many more questions. Yeah, go for ahead. You. <laughs> so here's a question. So when you're done working for the day, this is your office. This is all your stuff. This is yeah. where all the creations of Palladium come out of. And you shut the lights off for the office. You go home. You're done for the day. You're ready to game. What is your favorite OCC? Or occupational character class that people don't know out there. That I like as a player or as a game master or Well, as a player first, if you were Um I I tend to like sorcerers and thieves. Those those are, are two of my, my my favorite. Uh you know, on my game system I like psychic characters too, like the Mind Mage in Palladium Fantasy, one of my all time favorite characters. Um, one of my very first characters, because uh, when Julius was running us games, um, he let us have a split class, so I had a wizard thief. And in fact, my very first character was a thief who pretended he was a wizard. <laughs> and, and that was awesome, because he carved up the staff with all kinds of crazy symbols and stuff that meant nothing. You know, and and uh, I did that because Julius had explained you know, that orcs and stuff in D&D &D were like a, a superstitious lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, they're superstitious and stupid. So, you know, they'd come and I'd be like, stand back or I'll use the staff of whatever the heck it was. And, you know, Julius would roll to determine whether or not they, uh, you know, fell for it or not. And sometimes they did and sometimes they different, didn't, but it was, it was cool. So I like characters who kind of bluff and, uh, you know, are a little bit sneaky, but ultimately good guys. Um, so. Now, as a game master, I guess you could say, what kind of characters would you like to see to be able to torment? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've played a lot of games, so um, I've played all kinds of different villains, and uh, uh, in fact, Eric Woodge gave me a huge compliment where one day he said, just Kev, you are the master of villains. You create the greatest villains I've ever seen, and I'm like, cool. Uh, and again, I think that's my comic book background so I had a lot of great stuff to draw from from the Green Goblin to Doctor Doom to you know you name it and uh, so I played all kinds of guys I kind of like villains that have a certain amount of swagger and who are uh, arrogant and confident you know because those are kind of the scary guys you know the maniacs who are like oh take over the world now you're all dead they're cool don't get me wrong and, and I've, I've played plenty of those too but 
the guys I kind of really like are the guys who are sort of the stone cold killers. Where, you know, your group, especially with the defilers, you know, they'd always know, uh oh, our shit's in the wind when, you know, 12 of them would approach some guy and he just kind of steps back and goes, How can I help you, gentlemen? And they're like, He's not scared at all. He's not nervous. I mean, we're the freaking defilers. And I'm like, Nope. He's just, Hey, guys, what's up? Just another day at the office, so to speak. And, and then, you know, and they're like, Uh oh. Because, <laughs> you know, he's, he's that tough. And uh, or that powerful in one way or another, or he's got an entourage of guys they don't know that's about to swoop in. And I like the guys who are kind of the methodical, cold, cunning, but got panache. Um, he wasn't a villain, but he's that kind of character. I like to play basically Doc Holliday from Tombstone. Yes, yes, very... Those those are my favorite, some of my favorite villains. But I played some, like, psychos and just really down-to-earth. One, uh, one of the defiler, the, the group, my players, just hated with a passion, was a character I called Jack Ork. Uh, he was basically Jack the Ripper. Uh, oh, that's interesting. And uh, we were talking about earlier um, about Dr. Articulus and, and the twin sciences of magic and technology. Yes. Well, Jack was one of Dr. Articulus's first experiments. So what you, people didn't realize at first, because Jack was kind of shy. When you first meet Jack, he's a big, burly uh, orc, but he's kind of shy, kind of quiet, and he has this cloak, and it always covers his right arm. And when combat or torture, or a situation for torture happens, Jack kind of flings back the cloak, and he's got this mechanical arm with these finger blades that come out. And That's he's cool. really into torture and stuff. And the more excited he gets, the more you fight, the more confident and danger and, and psychotically murderous he gets. And he was one of the defilers for a while, a long while. I was like shocked. And they kind of reined him in pretty good, but they finally realized they had a problem after he had tortured a bunch of people when they said don't. I mean, hideously. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to give them hints like, you know, this guy's not good to be in your group of heroes, guys. But they didn't get it until they had beat some big bad guy. And uh, Jack wanted these uh, boots of fleetness or something. And it was like, no, this is going to our knight over here. And he's like, but I, but I want, you know, like Wolverine. But I want them. And they're like, Jack, no, it's. And they're like, and, and they had to like calm him down. And he's like, oh yeah, no, sorry guys, you know, that's puts the cloak back. And he's like, hey, to one of the guys in the back, you know, in the marching order. And as he's walking up towards them. He grabs the face of the guy who has the boots he wants. The claws go in, and he rips off the front of his face. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, he rolled a natural 20. I mean, this was all real. I don't, didn't just like, kill a player character. And, yeah, and the group's reaction was like, oh, man. And the, suddenly it's like, <laughs> holy crap, this guy's a really bad guy. And it's like, <laughs> no kidding. And, and Jack became a reoccurring villain after this obviously and uh, he got away and he got killed and got brought back by some demonic force that the defilers were fighting and he was just this brute and he was just this awesome character and the minute people heard the name Jack Ork or the description of him yeah we saw this guy and he had like finger blades you know blades for fingers they're like was his name Jack and we're like yeah I think so where is he you know, and the group was like just <laughs> ready to pounce so, you know, it's real, and that's again where you get in the whole element of Jack was a pretty, I mean, there's some cool psychotic things about him, but I mean. Absolutely. He, he was a really like, down to earth, a basic just, oh, a mad dog killer. I mean, there was no, but the characterization of it made it really nuanced and interesting. And these guys love to hate this villain. So. That is great. That is awesome. <laughs> That is very awesome. With uh, you know, you guys have so many, so many different genres of games out. So, for some people just getting into Palladium, where would you suggest they start? Where would be a good, uh, 
good system for them to start out to get a really good taste. Um, if you like horror, especially zombies, I would highly recommend um, Dead Rain. It, it's it's very uh, very straightforward. Um, I think it presents things. First of all, it's a setting that pretty much everyone knows, um, and um, you can play ordinary people. Um, I think that's a great introductory game. When we had the Robotech license, I would have said Robotech because that was also a good, you know, it's pretty straightforward war story. You know, Earth being invaded by aliens and the people are trying to stop it. Um, those two are great introductory games, and you can still get Robotech online. You know, used copies and stuff. Yeah, I just ordered one. Okay, I got one go. headed my way. There yeah, you go. yeah, you know. It, so, I, so those are great introductory games. Um, you know, none of our games are really hard. I think Rifts intimidates people because the concepts are so broad and they're because there are 90 books. Um, I get all the time people are going, I heard so much about Rifts and I want to play, but I don't know where to start. Well, <clears throat> start wherever you want. This is, is like I, I like to explain this, and um, this is what I love about Rifts, what I kind of call the quagmire. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I sit down to make a character. That doesn't sound real good. No, no, no. It, it, I sit down to make a character. And then I start reading. And then I just keep reading. And then I keep reading. And then I keep reading. And then I keep reading. Because it's, it, the story is so interesting. The characters, the descriptions that you give them. So it's like two hours passes by. And I'm like, hmm. Okay. Time to make a character. So, and it took me quite a long time to make the Cyber Knight because of the same, I was reading and just reading and just reading. And that world is so vast and my, yeah. my imagination is just running wild. And I'm thinking about all, all the possibilities that I have. So I took a quick break, I jumped online, and then I started looking around. And I found even more Rift books and even more Rift books. So, to, you know, of course, my wife's disapproval, I have quite a few on the way in the mail <laughs> heading towards me. And I, I, RIS is such an awesome, awesome system. And before I even picked up a RIS book, I, I talked to a lot of people. And I would meet two different people. The people who role-played that loved RIS, and I said, this is such a great system because of this, 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 and this. And the other people would say, I've never played a role-playing game. I can't tell you the first thing about this game. They're like, but the stories in here mm. are awesome. And I buy them and I read them because they are just so good and they are so interesting. Yeah. And that is just really cool. Which I take as a huge compliment and uh, I appreciate that. Because we, we do, we try to put a lot into our games. And um, like I said before... For me, role-playing is all about character and story, and that story starts with our books. So I try to create a very exciting world, and, you know, when I, when I design the stuff and when I write any, any of our game books, like I said, I always keep my audience in mind, so I'm constantly thinking, okay, what would get me excited as a player? So I guess I'm kind of role-playing, role-playing. Go figure. But... Oh. <laughs> Absolutely, it works. And it, it works. It is great. I have to tell you, I, I love just sitting down, just even reading this book, and I love it. The story of the ley lines when the rifts open up, what happens, the, the dark age, the two hundred years that, yeah. passed. and I mean, you introduce such a large timeline of events that. It's endless, and with the other books that you have out there for riffs, I mean, it's like a wide open, endless system for people. Well, yeah, because to that's sort of my philosophy of role playing is, if you can think of it, you should be able to play it. And and, and again, I, getting back to like beginner players, when I started role playing, I was very rigid, and I would spend a freaking week working up my dungeon. And what got me out of this was my Maniac 26 guys where, you know, we're doing all this and they really wanted to fight vampires. So, and I keep going back to the Defiler's because that's sort of my initiation into role playing and 
where I learned tons and tons of different things, and, and plus it was epic, and great guys, all of them. And uh, so anyways, I have this epic, it was my biggest, most elaborate dungeon setup I had ever done. It was epic. And they're ready to literally open that door to level four, when one of the guys goes, why are we always going down into this dungeon? There's a whole world out here. What's around us? And I'm like, all right, guys, vampires, level four, vampires. <laughs> and someone else goes, yeah, what is out there? And the next thing you know, the whole group is like, no, we'll go to level four next week. We want to go adventuring out into the woods. I have nothing. I have no idea what's out there. It was total ab -lib. I had to just wing it completely. They had a great time, so now next week, they still want to explore out in the woods. So I'm just kind of rocking and rolling, and it, it was great. It was such fun. It was very freeing. I mean, it's a little bit demanding on, on the Game Master, but I mean, it's something I get very used to. So for me, it's just second nature to just kind of wing all this stuff. Uh, I'm really good at improv. But, um, and, and, and you know, they bring up these crazy ideas. Again, when you have 26 guys, one maniac or another is going to come up with something that you never thought of. But half the time it'd be like, wow, that sounds really cool. How can I make that work for these guys? It, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because in my videos I talk about where a lot of people getting into this and I explain the importance of your character, good background, having a really good antagonist as a focal point in the story to keep moving that story forward. But my love of being able to adventure and discover the wilderness. Because it is so simple to create because yeah. it's the wilderness. And like you said, unlike a dungeon to where you're just descending level to level to level to level to level to wherever. And I even brought this up before in my videos. I said, so what happens after 12 hours of adventuring? I mean, do these guys, you know, do they have a cafeteria or something here right. that they go to to be able to, you know, right. it's the end of the day, kick their feet up, get something to eat and relax? Right, right. So, absolutely. I mean, that, the wilderness aspect of it is awesome. It's very awesome. And you do a really good job detailing out, especially in the world map with Palladium Fantasy. And showing that world and um, monsters, beasts, and monsters. I'm trying to remember the name of the book. I have it at home on my shelf. Monsters and animals. Monsters and animals. Thank you. And in your book, as you look at these encounters and it breaks it down, the geological area that they come from. Yep. Which is really really cool. Um, when I first started making these videos, you know, and I'm thinking of the older D and D products where the encounters would tell you the terrain that they came from. Right. And so I'm thinking from the perspective, like, hey, everybody's got to have this, right? And talking, like, yeah, you just go through, you know, blah, 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 blah. People are like, what are you talking about? This book doesn't have that. It doesn't even mention anything about it. And I'm like, wow. And then when I ran across that book and I was looking at it, I'm like, this is cool. This takes it a step further. I mean, not only are you explaining where they're coming from, you're showing me a map. And with the map, that just gives you more to build on. It really gets your imagination going as to how you want to put these encounters in that area. Sure. You know what I mean? I, well, we're doing do. the same thing with the Rifts Bestiary. Um, we're working on the Rifts. So Rifts is a million books, all kinds of creatures. Um, and, and, of course, they're scattered through a lot of different, different products. So... We're collecting them all up and we're expanding the write-ups and we're putting them in what we're calling the Rift's Bestiary, which will be a series of three or six books or so. And uh, we're doing the same thing. The first two volumes at least will be uh, North America. We're going to have maps of North America and where these creatures are mostly found or only found and that'll be in there. And then we're even putting more detail about the creatures and their habits and that kind of thing, who their enemies and natural enemies and allies and things are. And, and what should we look forward to? Uh, the first book, uh, Rift's Bestiary, Volume 1, should go to the printer sometime this month. I'm hoping sooner than later. 
So uh, sometime in April it'll be out. April? Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm definitely going to Maybe the end of March, but I think that's... The problem is, you know, printers can only turn books around so fast. So if we get it into them in the next week or two, it's pro possibly the last few days of March, more likely the first week or two of April. That is okay. awesome. That is awesome. And it's a great book. I you saw some art. I was did the artwork art. was beautiful. Absolutely Which, like beautiful. I mentioned, if you want to film some of it and show them, that's absolutely that's, that's absolutely. Fine. Yeah. Now I have another question for you here. Sure. Me being the solo player and my audience solo players, so with the old school revival or the OSR as they like to call it, yeah. and now there's a growing game market out there for solo play. A couple of books that come to mind is Mythic, Mythic Game System. They have an emulator. There's another one out there called Four Against Darkness that's meant for solitary play. And there's a lot more games coming out that are offering this. Um, a couple of people on my Facebook page, I was just looking at it today, posted even D&D &D has put out now a table section for a single player. Where do you see Palladium Fantasy with that market? With Oh, I mean, so for me, you know, honestly, until I met you, I was not really aware of the market. I had heard people mention it, but I wasn't really sure what it was. You know, now as I become aware of it, it's something we may consider down the road. Uh, we're also looking at doing, uh, I don't know if I should say this, because it's something I've been kicking around for a couple of years and haven't gotten, well, I've started it, but I want to produce a bunch of games uh, and settings, basically adventure Mini adventure role playing games for kids. So a parent could just grab it and say, Here, we're playing this. And um, kind of a, not, in some ways, a simplified version of our games. More of almost like just like really focused adventures that you can just take and, and play. I think people, people will dig that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it sounds like it's something that solo players could take and easily adapt. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, I'm going to look into the solo thing, because we hear all the time from people who, oh man, my, my group, we all grew up, we all spread out all over the country, I love your games, don't, get, don't have anyone to play with. And, yeah, and yeah. I mean, and it's, you know, no secret that the invention of the internet not only has the convenience of our lives rapidly increased, but it's also sped up everything else about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which leaves us with less and less time. Yep. Because more people now want to connect through, I'm going to say Facebook Messenger, because you can talk to the person yep. face to face yep. rather than yep. Yep. getting in the car and driving over there. So, in a way, it's kind of been taking away some of those social aspects of our life. Yeah. And like you said, with other people moving and scattering away. And for people like me that love role playing, well, I guess there's always the solo option. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let me get to my next question here because I've kind of veered off course here a little bit. Yeah, sorry. I'm no, no, I'm it's okay. Off. Well, I believe that was it. I think, my God, that went quick. That went real quick. Well, it seems like it does. It's probably longer than we think. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure. And so, if you like the video, click the like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Click the little bell icon. And every time I upload a new video, you will hear about it. And with that being said, this is Kevin with Palladium Books. I'm hey sorry. Guys. I am horrible with names. I try to do shout outs all the time. Uh -huh. Every time I do it, I slaughter people's name. Okay. How is your last name? pronounced. All right, so it's Polish. The American pronunciation is Sambita. Sambita. Shambieta, if you're Polish. Okay. I answered anything except for shithead. <laughs> <laughs> so if it has an S sound, I'll probably respond. Unless so it's shithead. Then Kevin. Nope. Sambita. And I'm going to leave a link in the description taking you to the Palladium site to where you can go on there, you can look at the full catalog of everything they have to offer, and there is a wide selection to choose from. Oh, and so, we have a sale going on right now. Wow. 
So yeah, a lot, a lot of the core books and some basic, uh, just ironically, um, although by the time this airs it might not. But okay. we have sales off and on. No, time, no, it's so. going to air. Honey, you want to turn it off at this point. You didn't hear anything about sale. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. Thank you very much, great, Kevin. Man. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much. But, what did you think? Before we leave that video off, what if I was to tell you he gave me exclusive privilege to be able to film some of the art coming out in the book that's going to be released later this month, beginning of next month. The art that's on right on the paper. I was so close, I could actually see the eraser marks that the artist has done that will be featured inside these books. Stick around for the feature content where I'm going to show you some of these art clips and Kevin's going to give you a little bit more info about it. Alright, let's get on with the show. So tell us what's here, Kevin. Nothing. Nothing? Top secret stuff. Hey, wait, is that a camera? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> this is some of the new artwork for the Rift's Bestiary Volume 1. Um, most of it's by Chuck Walton. Almost all of it's Chuck Walton. And it's awesome. It's very awesome. This is very, very cool stuff right here. Yeah, it's going to be a great book. I think people are going to love it. We're looking, f I know, I am looking forward to its release, as I am sure many people out there are. Yeah, it's taken a bit longer than we wanted, but uh, it's going to be worth it. A couple others. That is absolutely, absolutely awesome. Very gifted artist. Oh, yeah. Chuck's fantastic. Very, very cool stuff, man. My God. Yeah, and he'll be working on the cover to uh, uh, Rift Beast Jerry number two, and he's also doing the cover to uh, Garden of the Gods. So that is awesome. Yeah, good stuff. And there you have it. It was a good day for old Artichoke. On top of that, I took my own copy of Palladium Fantasy in. Kevin was so nice to sign up for me. And bottom of my heart to all of them guys over there at Palladium, thank you so much, so much for a great time. Keep up the good work. Keep kicking out the great content. And like I said, guys, for the solo player, you got to check out Palladium Fantasy. If you're a fantasy buff, check out Palladium. You're not going to regret it. And Riffs, awesome book, excellent book. Just as I explained in the interview and Kevin told you, anything you can think of and imagine, any time from way far advanced in the future, to medieval times, to modern times, to just alternate realities and universes of a role-playing game you want to play. You can find it in Rifts. Now this is a cool book I picked up right here, Book of Magic today, amongst a few other books here that I will get into in some later videos. I'm really excited to sit down with my dice-proof cup of coffee and some palladium. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I don't know if you enjoyed it as much as I did. But if you did, do me a favor. Give me a thumbs up. Click that like button. And please feel free to hit the subscribe button. Click the bell icon to be notified of my videos. But please share the video. Get it out there so other people can see what Palladium does. And really, what a great guy uh, Kevin really is. He's a really great guy. And I have to admit, I have to say, after being through there, spending the afternoon with Kevin and getting to know him better, 
I'm a palladium person through and through. So, all right, folks, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting the channel. I love you guys so much, and I cannot wait till the next video. So until then, this is Artichoke Dip, signing off.